Effective teaching strategies come from where? Sitting together with your colleagues and sharing those best practices. Taking a look at how do you differentiate your instruction in your classroom? How do you meet the needs of kids in your classroom? When kids are struggling with this, what do you do? That's when we begin to improve our professional practices. When we sit together and I ask you, okay, we know that one of the, we know that one of the keys to effective assessment is for us to give good student feedback. Not just points, not just a score, but feedback on how you can improve. So I would go to my colleague and I go, well, what do you do? This is a new area for me. I've always given points and score and you know, those kinds. Of, how are you giving feedback? I might, and if you don't know, then we're going to look at it together. We'll do a collective inquiry, right? We know that another effective key for assessment, improving assessment, is to engage the students in the assessment process beyond just taking the test. So I'd go to you, okay, how are we going to engage the kids in the assessment? And you'll say, oh, I got this great strategy, okay? And I'm going to give the kids the rubric or the check sheet. How many of you use check sheets instead of rubrics? A checklist instead of the rubric? Yeah. You can do both, either one. For the concrete learners, use the checklist. And most of your elementary kids are concrete learners, right? A checklist, you got to do this, 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 and this. Prove it. In order for this paper to be good, for this project to be right, for this performance event to be at the top, here are the steps you have to have in place, and then put the word prove it, and then they check it off. It's easier for the kid in the concrete learner stage to look at that than a rubric. But here's what you could do. You say, so I'm having my kids develop their, their own rubric from their sense of what this project could look like. I'm having them connect to the checklist and then giving them examples of weak work and strong work so that they get connected to the expectations and the outcomes. Now, I wouldn't have known that had you not told me. So collaboratively, we improve our schools and ourselves and our practices because effective teaching matters. When we think about intervention programs, this is the model that we are, have, has been rolled out by the federal government. We think that that very bottom one is essential. I was in, I was in a, one academy, not here, but another academy. And this middle school teacher comes up, principal comes up and says, hey, can you sit down with our team? We want to talk about our intervention. We put one in during the school day, but we had to quit doing it. I said, oh man, really? That's like and the biggest step is to put an intervention during the school day and not just have it before and after school. He says, I know, I know. We put it in place, but we had to quit doing it. I said, why did you have to quit doing it? He said, we had too many kids who needed an intervention. I said, really, how many? He said, a thousand. I said, you had a thousand kids? How many are in your school? He says, 1,200. I said, okay, there is a core problem. The very first level, as you all know, because uh, you are elementary people and you know how this works, the very first level of intervention is not to send them somewhere else to have the problem solved. The very first level of intervention is your classroom. And looking inside the classroom and saying, is there something I could do differently? How do I have my kids work in small groups? Have I managed that appropriately? And do I actually have the right kind of strategies involved in that as I work with my kids in small groups? Particularly the kids that struggle. You guys understand the research probably better than most. Because the research says if you want to close the gaps of struggling learners, you need to put them into groups, small groups, like a reading, a reading problem. They need to be in a small group for a minimum of 20 minutes, at least four days a week, if you're going to really solve their problems. So we understand that research, don't we? So somehow or another, we have organized ourselves, either through our team effort or just our effort in the classroom, we have organized ourselves to meet with those kids. Now, does that mean you have to meet with every group of kids four times a week for 20 minutes? No. The research says you don't need to meet with your top kids that often. That given the opportunity and the criteria by which you're asking them to perform, they will go ahead and do that on their own. So your top kids, so it's not every group every day, but the struggling learners, if you want to close their gaps, they need more. You know how, anybody here a struggling learner when you were in school? You were a struggling learner. Yeah, you notice what that means is, sometimes we don't admit that, but honestly, most teachers weren't. Most teachers did pretty well in school. And so if your teachers in your school, when you were growing up, didn't do small groups on a regular basis, sometimes we don't do small groups because you didn't struggle. But I did. And so when my teacher sat down next to us that struggled, the buzzard group, okay? <laughs> he didn't admit it, we weren't, you know. She didn't call us that, but boy, you knew you were. <laughs> okay, you know. I can't, yeah, okay. I was a quiet kid in school, right? 
Hard to believe now, but I really was, all right? And so when she sat down, I was much more likely to ask a question and be engaged because I didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the rest of my class by not knowing something. So she made it very risk-free by doing that. So I understand small groups. And I understand the need to make them flexible and not lock a kid in all the time. And that was probably the drawback to our buzzard group is we were buzzards all year long. Never got to move to the eagle group, okay? I'll challenge you to keep it flexible, keep monitoring their progress. If you have a group that is always a buzzard group, then something's not working in your strategies. They needed they need something else from you to move them. So you will constantly engage in that reflection. What else could I do? And it is so much easier to reflect with a colleague in collaboration who might have more skills or different skills or enhanced skills than you might have. So think about that. Think about why kids struggle. How, how many of you know this show? Okay, so you know how it works, right? I've always wondered, I've wanted to do this, okay? So let's say you've you got Family Feud going on and Richard Dawson is up there and he says, he wouldn't be up there now, but let's say he was up there and he says, all right, we have 100 teachers were surveyed, the top three answers are on the board, why do students struggle or why do students fail? In schools that have casual conversations about this, who won't collaborate about this, who won't really look into the mirror about this, I have the top three answers, they're right there. All right, at your table, see if you can come up. If in a casual conversation, what are the top three reasons? All right, top three reasons from this table, real loud. What's one? They don't, they're not motivated. Thank you. Uh, let's go over here. Another one. Lack of individual instruction. Okay, well, most teachers won't say that, but that's okay. <laughs> in a ranch, he says lack of individual instruction. You know that. But in a casual conversation, that isn't the one we usually pick. <laughs> okay, but I like that, all right. Lack of individual instruction, absolutely. You're ahead of the game, okay. All right, give me another one. In casual conversation. But parents don't care. Parents don't care, okay, good. All right, another one. Poor attitude. Yeah, a lot of teachers will say that these kids just have a poor attitude. They're not motivated, they have a poor attitude, they're lazy, they're, and some teachers say, and they're always absent. Right, here they are. Top three reasons. Number one, they're. Number two, they're. Number three, I'll contend that we need to go deeper. I want to ask you to do that. All right. Um, oh, by the way, on the motivation thing, you don't have this slide yet, but it is in your handouts for further on. But I thought, you know, those people that say kids aren't motivated, my first, and I hear that when I go in and work with teams and work with schools. I said, really? Have you, looked, have you looked at the research, the essential elements, and asked yourself this question? Are you fulfilling your responsibility to help motivate kids? If you are, then you create a positive school climate and a positive relationship. If you are doing your work, then you will give good feedback to kids to help them succeed. If you're doing your work, your work will be active and hands-on. I love the work of Marsha Tate. Marsha Tate write, writes all these books, particularly for elementary, all right? There is um, reading worksheets won't grow dendrites. Math worksheets won't grow dendrites. Sit and get won't grow dendrites. Those th things in the brain that cause connections and learning to occur. And she says, hands-on, active work will grow dendrites. The brain research, Brain Rules, which is by John Medina. He said, 12 rules by which the brain works. Active engagement is critical to brain, the brain working and learning. So you would do, are we hands-on? Is it active or is it sit and get, filling out pages or worksheets? Do we pay attention to learning styles? I bet you all of you on the first day of school will inventory your elementary kids on their learning styles, their interests, what they choose to be interested in so that you could actually gear some of your instruction to choice because that's motivating to kids. So you'll pull out the work on differentiating instruction in the classroom and you'll pull out that survey and you'll be sure that you do it, right? With your kids, an interest survey for elementary kids. There's also one for secondary. Tying learning to, into interest and making it interesting, avoid bribery. I know none of us do bribery to kids, all right? Bribery is different than celebrations. <laughs> Bribery is, you gotta hold this carrot out in order for you to do it. 
Someone once said, if you gotta hold a carrot out to get somebody to do it, it's not worth doing. Here's the thing, I, I mean, I know there's a carrot out for you guys to be here today, you get some professional development credit. I hope that's not why you chose to be here. I hope that when it says, what was the most meaningful thing you got out of the um, workshop today, I hope you don't write on the evaluation, my professional development credit. What I hope is you this didn't have to take a carrot to get you here. You're here because you want to learn with your colleagues, right? And look at what the possibilities are. So avoid bribery. Give students voice and choice. Make connections and, and get to the higher order of thinking. And then put learning into the context of making it into the real world. Making, I, I heard a guy speak one day. He's a math teacher. He's a math teacher. He goes, I have one of the most, and he, and he was just speaking to this crowd. They didn't know he was a math teacher yet. He says, I have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. I try every day to sell a product to a group of people who absolutely don't want it. And he says, I had to start thinking about that and say, how can I make them want it? And it wasn't until he connected it to the real world, problem solving, not just doing formulas and mathematical number sense, but instead problem solving it into the context of the real world. He says, doing that, man, he says, that, my kids light up for that kind of stuff. So we would investigate the motivation theories and put them into place when we say kids aren't motivated to learn. There are other reasons though that challenge our students in terms of their success or failure. Curriculum practices that don't work and curriculum practices that do work. Assessment practices that are the right kind of assessment practices and assessment practices that you go, I measured you, I put it in the grade book, we're moving on. There's the instructional practice of whole group instruction, which sometimes is necessary. Direct instruction is not bad. But direct instruction without, as she said, individual attention to instruction is. So instructional practices that we might want to investigate. There are sometimes some simple beliefs that some people hold. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. All right, I'm going to divide the group. You have on page two a handout. Page two, not of the PowerPoint, but of the next sheets, okay? I think they're on different colored paper, I hope. I hope it's page two. I don't know if I actually numbered it right. Oh, you guys included the table of contents. So my, yeah, it's the one that has all the boxes, reasons kids fail. Is it page two? Page two. All right, so if you're in this section of the room, tables one, rows one, two, and three, I want you at your tables to address the one that says curriculum practices, okay? What are some curriculum practices that might be causing kids to fail based on what we've already heard today plus what you already know, all right? Uh, the rest of this group here, uh, tables one, two, three, and four, this group in here, would you please think about at your tables and come up with some answers in those boxes of reasons that kids fail that might be associated to assessment practices, okay? Ones that we do that aren't good and how we could get better at it. Uh, we'll take this group over here, rows one, two, three, and four also. And would you deal with the instructional issues that sometimes get in the way? Brainstorm at your tables. You're gonna have about two or three minutes to do this. All the reasons that kids might be failing because instructional practices might be off the mark a little bit. All right, and then we'll investigate those together. This group, this group, you've got the, because I'm leaving out the outside influences because you can't control those even though we talk about those the most, okay? Now I wanna talk about our beliefs in our school. Are there some beliefs in our school that are getting in the way of us really helping kids learn at the high level? The belief that some folks have that, oh, it's these kids, how could they possibly get better? Okay, so deal with the beliefs that might exist in, in any school. Might be yours, might not be yours, but that you hear from other people. You have about three minutes as a team to work these. You need to be accountable for those, so someone be a recorder as you write those down. You're brainstorming, throwing them out, not at a whole bunch of discussion. Three minutes, then you're gonna share some of your thoughts with others in the room. All right, it works this way. Um, right next to you is a table for a pair, right? So I'm gonna ask you now to pair up with the table right next to you, not the one behind you, but the one right next to you. And I'd like for you to build your list. This is called Goyles. I know a lot of you use this in your class, groups of increasingly larger sizes. You have kids meet and talk about the learning, then you expand it to groups of four, then to groups of eight, and so forth. So we're gonna do the same process here. 
You're going to pair up and I want you to expand your list, listening in on each other and ex extend it. Other things that you might not have thought about, but a chance to have a conversation with the people right next to you. That means you're going to have to stand. This is a movement activity. All right, so stand, circle up, share your thoughts with each other. Then we're going to share out with a larger group. But let's expand our list first of all, all right, with the table right next to you. 